Thank you. Well, before I begin on the issue of Bernie Sanders, I will not betray the Palestinian people ever, which means that I will not support Bernie Sanders or anyone who does not stand up for the oppressed, all of the oppressed. I'm tired of selling the Palestinians out. That's over. And if we're not willing to fight that battle, we're not going to fight any battle. He's an APAC wind-up doll like the rest of them. Look at that Senate vote. We live in a revolutionary moment. The disastrous economic and political experiment that attempted to organize human behavior around the dictates of the global marketplace has failed. The promised prosperity that was to have raised the living standards of workers through trickle-down economics has been exposed as a lie. A tiny global oligarchy has amassed obscene wealth, while the engine of unfettered corporate capitalism plunders resources, exploits cheap, unorganized labor, and creates pliable, corrupt governments that abandon the common good to serve corporate profit. The relentless drive by the fossil fuel industry for profits is destroying the ecosystem threatening the very viability of the human species. And no mechanisms to institute genuine reform or halt the corporate assault are left within the structures of power which have surrendered to corporate control. The citizen has become irrelevant he or she can participate in heavily choreographed elections, but the demands of corporations and banks are paramount. History has amply demonstrated that the seizure of power by a tiny cabal, whether a political party or a clique of oligarchs, leads to despotism. Governments then cater exclusively to a narrow interest group and redirect the machinery of state to furthering the interests of that group are no longer capable of responding rationally in times of crisis. Blindly serving their masters, they acquiesce to the looting of state treasuries to bail out corrupt financial houses and banks while ignoring chronic unemployment and underemployment, along with stagnant or declining wages, crippling debt peonage, a collapsing infrastructure, and the millions left destitute and sometimes homeless by deceptive mortgages and foreclosures. A bankrupt liberal class holding up values it does nothing to defend discredits itself as well as the purported liberal values of a civil democracy as it is swept aside along with those values. In this moment of political, economic, or natural disaster in short a crisis will ignite unrest lead to instability, and see the state carry out draconian forms of repression to maintain order. This is what lies ahead. And we will, as Frederick Engels wrote, either make a transition to socialism or barbarism.
if, if we do not dismantle global capitalism, we will descend into the Hobbesian chaos of failed states, mass migrations, which we are already witnessing, and endless war. Populations, especially in the global south, will endure increased misery and high mortality rates caused by collapsing ecosystems and infrastructures on a scale not seen since, since perhaps the Black Plague. There can be no accommodation with global capitalism. We will overthrow this system. Let me repeat that word for homeland security, that's overthrow. We will overthrow this system or be crushed by it. And at this moment of crisis, we need to remind ourselves what being a socialist means and what it does not mean. First and foremost, all socialists are unequivocal anti-militarists and anti-imperialists. They understand that there is no genuine social, political, economic, or cultural reform as long as the militarists and their corporate allies in the war industry continue to loot and pillage the state budget, leaving the poor to go hungry, working men and women in distress, and the infrastructure and social services to be neglected or slashed in the name of austerity. The psychosis of permanent war which infect the body politic and has done so since after World War I with the internal and external war on communism and which today has mutated into the war on terror is used by the state to strip us of civil liberties, redirect our resources to the war machine and criminalize democratic dissent. We have squandered trillions of dollars and resources in endless and futile wars from Vietnam to the Middle East at a time of ecological and physical crisis. And the folly of endless war is one of the signs of a dying civilization. One F-22 Raptor fighter plane costs $350 million and we have 187 of them. One Tomahawk cruise missile costs $1.41 million, and we fired 161 of them at Libya. And that attack alone cost us a quarter of a billion dollars. We spend an estimated $1.7 trillion a year on war far more than the official 54% of discretionary spending, or roughly $600 billion. And if we do not break the back of the war machine, profound change will be impossible. We have been at war almost continuously since the first Gulf War in 1991 followed by Somalia in 1992, Haiti in 1994, Bosnia in 1995, Serbia, Kosovo in 1999, Afghanistan in 2001, where we have now been fighting for 14 years, and Iraq in 2003. And we can toss in Yemen, Libya, Pakistan, and Syria, along with Israel's proxy war against the Palestinian people. The human cost 
has been horrendous. Over one million lives lost in Iraq. Millions more displaced or refugees. Iraq will never be reconstituted as a unified state. And it was our war industry that created the mess. We attacked a country that did not threaten us and had no intention of threatening its neighbors and destroyed one of the most modern infrastructures in the Middle East. We brought not only terror and death, including the Shiite death squads that we armed and trained, but power outages, food shortages, and the collapse of basic services from garbage collection to sewer and water treatment. We dismantled Iraq's institutions, disbanded its security forces, threw its health service into crisis, and engineered massive poverty and unemployment. And out of the chaos rose insurgents, gangsters, kidnapping rings, jihadists, and rogue military groups, including our hired mercenaries. Gary Leup, in an article in Counterbunch titled, How George W. Bush Destroyed the Temple of Baal, got it when he wrote, Bush destroyed the law and order, which had permitted girls to walk to school heads uncovered in modern Western dress. He destroyed the freedom of physicians and other professionals to go about their work and caused masses of them to exit their country. He destroyed neighborhoods where residents were forced to flee for their lives. He destroyed the Christian community which dropped from 1.5 million in 2001 to perhaps 200,000 a decade later. He destroyed the prevalent ideology of secularism and ushered in an era of bitterly contested sectarian rule. He destroyed the right to broadcast rock and roll music or sell liquor and DVDs. He destroyed the stability of Anbar province by sowing the chaos that allowed Abu Musab al-Zarqawi to establish, for the first time, an al-Qaeda branch in Iraq. He destroyed the stability of Syria when al-Qaeda in Mesopotamia, now ISIL, retreated into that neighboring country during the surge of 2007 by creating power vacuums and generating new chapters and spin-offs of al-Qaeda. He destroyed the Yazidi communities and their freedom from genocide and slavery. By hatching the forerunner of ISIL, he destroyed the prospects for a peaceful Arab Spring in Syria three years after his presidency ended. Through his actions, he destroyed the border between Syria and Iraq. He destroyed the tomb of Jonah in Mosul. He destroyed 3,300-year-old monuments, the glorious art of the Assyrians in Nimrod. On August 23rd, while standing, sitting in his home artist studio in Crawford, Texas, he destroyed the 2,000-year-old temple of Baal Shamin in Palmyra, Syria. The most complete structure in that gorgeous pearl of an ancient preserved city a mix of Roman, Syrian, and Egyptian artistic influences is now a pile of rubble.